Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a, another episode of Questlove Supreme. I'm Questlove, your host. Uh, I, I gotta remind myself that we're now also not just a radio podcast, that we are a uh, visual podcast on our YouTube channel. I should plug it more. Um, yeah, so I'm in my uh, my red room, <laughs> not the bedroom. Uh, we're here with the Team Supreme right now. Uh, Sick Steve, what's up, man? How you doing, Amir? How's it, how's it feel to be back at work? It feels really good. I missed my Fallon family and uh, very excited about the five-star review that we got in Downbeat for the Plum That's Box. That's right, man. And we did it. We did Downbeat it. Magazine for the, the Plum album. Yes, I'm, absolutely. I'm walking on air. Nice. Uh, Laia, how, how, how goes it? It is going well, friend. You, I am you, excited about this conversation. Are you you uh, recovered from our LA assault? Yes, I'm just recovering from your your yeah, departure. Seriously, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, mm-hmm. It took a while, right? Yeah, I'm glad I wasn't alone with that. Okay. I'm paid bill. What's up, man? <laughs> Sir, everything's good. How's, how's life on the street? Life on the street's good. I got back from our trip to LA. I was home for a day, and I went to Spain and Portugal for a week. So I'm a little like, uh, what's all that for you? What's 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 going on? Uh, I haven't been on vacation in like a year for those who have children. You uh, take those? Vacation. I do, but once a year. And so uh, I went to Spain, Portugal, and I sat on a chair and I uh, drank and I ate and uh, it was fantastic. Oh, and I no. recommend Portugal. It's beautiful. Okay. And now I'm back. I got back oh. yesterday. Speak of uh, taking a break, uh, you know, Fontecolo is uh, recovering from his uh, his uh, his his wait. Is it Charlotte or where did they Durham. do the, the Durham, Durham, baby, Durham, Durham. baby. Yep. Okay, yeah. y'all went block party. I no, they're virtually. Well, let's get to it. Um, yes. This is pretty much a, an episode I've been waiting for a long time to do. We always said we should have this guest on our show, but I didn't think it could ever happen. Um, no. I will say that uh, as half of a, a mammoth mammoth duo, our guest today sort of came crashing into our lives in late nineteen eighty eight. With uh, an unescapable single entitled "Girl, You Know It's True." Uh, soon after that, uh, four other mammoth singles all went to the top of the charts. Uh, millions of hit singles, millions of hit albums. Later, uh, you know, him and his partner basically ruled 1989 with an iron fist. Uh, pretty much rode their success all the way to the bank. Uh, subsequently, they were hit with um, probably one of the craziest music scandals that rocked an entire industry um which is kind of ironic considering that in hindsight some 35 years later they were actually pioneers in pretty much how the music industry is today like you know i I know that oftentimes um especially in the last 10 years there's been um you, you hear this word called fake outrage. Uh, we hear it a lot in politics, but, you know, having been alive during that period, the sort of shocking scandal of what this uh, gentleman has went through is pretty much the standard norm now. Matter of fact, it's it's it is the norm. So, <laughs> you know, so many people no, even with I mean, you know, the number one our number one activity is TikTok. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so we, we basically sort of gravitate and participate in the, the, the practice that some 35 years ago, we were like aghast and, and sort of shocked to do. And now, you know, it's the standard. And so, um, it's kind of weird how you can be in a scandal one second and sort of a martyr the next minute. But, you know, I will basically say that our guests literally face the music um, and really work to shift the narrative, um, especially after losing uh, his partner, uh, Rob Pilatus. And now, 35 years later, after Girl You Know It's True, um, he's getting to tell his story, tell his truth, and really getting the last word in uh, with a very, very powerful documentary simply titled Nilly Vanilli. It'll be on up. Uh, paramount plus um i'm mind blown you know and um thank god that we get to say welcome to quest of supreme sir fab morvan 
Uh, thank you for joining us today, man. How you doing? Pleasure, man. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, you know, we're, we're going to get down. We're going to talk. We're going to chop it up and, and get into it. And I'm so pleased that I know when I've seen your career, I've seen you grow, I've seen you evolve. And and uh, for you to, to – the first introduction was amazing. <laughs> you know, fabulous, fantastic. Thank you, man. Thank you. You're right, and you're right about what happened 35 years ago and bringing it back fast forward here. And it is the norm, and it is normal, and nobody's actually flinching to anything because right. now everybody's in cahoots. Everybody's working together. And it, mm. it's all about – I get it. The music industry is about that paper, but it's become and turned into like, Wow. The veil, the magical veil, is like lifted. You, you you don't know until until it's time to really do it, right. and that's where it comes down to. If you can do it, do it. If you can't, and don't try to, they won't find you out. That's well, it. you know, now we're we're in a place where, uh, as I spoke to Steve earlier about being back to work. I mean, right now we're about to go a step past that. I mean, not even three months ago, um, someone had admitted or enlisted uh, for consideration of a Grammy, um, a weekend in Drake song that doesn't exist. So, AI. you know, the first AI song <laughs> is about to get. Now, and what's really crazy is, I, can I say it? I think I like that AI song better that's than right. any song on the current Drake record right now. But that's also because, you know, there's a certain texture that I like the music that, you know, right. that that particular AI song with Drake and Weekend is that isn't on the Drake record. But um, I have so many questions to ask. Uh, number one, you know, the 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 one thing I was curious about. Um, so you grew up where you in France or? Yeah, I grew up in Paris, in the center okay. of Paris, in uh, the 20th part. That's where I grew up, and that was my, my playground, you know, just beginning. And I come from a Creole household. Okay. So we grew up with, with all kinds of music, you know, salsa, merengue. And then my dad was playing Otis Redding and James Brown. My mom was playing Mar Maria Callas and some okay. classical music. It was always a kind of a potpourri at home, musically. I I'm curious. Well, the thing that I was really curious about was um, I I always wanted to know, especially this being the 50th anniversary of hip hop culture. I want to know uh, you being sort of the first generation of, of European people to receive hip hop from the States as it's coming in the 80s. Like how 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 did that get translated to you or how did that come over uh, to France and to Germany, to all those parts of Europe? Well, it, it came as in, in different forms, you know. We all know, you know, that hip hop is graffiti. You know, it's it's the art of poetry, mm -hmm. and it's street dancing, and it's the rap, mm -hmm. and and all started to appear in various parts of Paris. So you had the graffiti, you started to appear, of course, because we had the movies. You know, we had um, Crush Groovin. You okay. Know, that movie got over there and we were trying to emulate everything and like, okay, so you got graffiti, you have the dancing, you have pop lock, you, you got the floor as well. Mm -hmm. And then you got, you got the DJ that's doing the, the block party and we we're all looking at it like, wow. And some people were migrating towards what they felt like, okay, that's me or that's me. And some people, you know, went everywhere and experimented and if you go if you look at the effect of hip-hop throughout the world you, you will see that there's a dance scene of graffiti there's still mm -hmm. um like the forefathers of you know like crazy legs you have the cr italian crazy legs you have the german crazy legs so hip-hop okay. just spread out to us like crazy and for me being a black kid you know and the majority of Hip hop at the time, it was it, it looked brown and dark. It looked like me, so it was like, oh, oh, okay. So that's that's, you know, I was connecting with it. And America so, being 
and the land of opportunity and, and like Hollywood and you know entertainment. So mm-hmm. we were really focused on on what was going on, and that was for the youth. That was mm-hmm. my youth. Was it was it sort of like uh, I mean, was it mainstream as in like these movies are in the theater or was it contraband? Because, you know, the short time that I lived in um, Europe during like the roots formative years, like our first three years, we were in Europe a lot. And, you know, the way that they would collect, you know, there was always like a friend or a cousin in the United States that would send tapes uh, over, yeah. you know, of radio shows and whatnot. And, movies were hard to come by like you you need to be connected to someone that could send you these things or whatever so like how would you guys get the music and the culture if it's not like done firsthand like i know that at least the way the stories explain in the movie that both you and and uh rob were you know kind of lone sort of lone wolves and basically like lone black people, singular black That's people right. and, and, and otherwise like mm-hmm. non-black environment. So how are, how are but, you guys able to receive this information? Well, as a kid in France, it was very difficult to get it. But when I moved to Germany, I was taken to, I lived in different places, but I went to, those clubs and those clubs were full of American GIs because the American base were based in Germany. Oh, so okay. I ended up going to like those clubs where, you know, they were doing the, you know, the dance, <laughs> doing the, the prep, DJ had the gloves. <laughs> man, they had the, the DJ had the white gloves and they were doing, people would get on the floor and like, you know, it was like for us, it was like for Rob and I was like, whoa, it was like being in America because there's okay. nothing but Americans in the club. So from there, we, we, we got a lot there in Germany, but in France, you really had to look for it. You had to go to a record store. I didn't have the money. So maybe we put our money together. We get the records, we get the cassettes, but to mm-hmm. get the videos, that was another mission because yeah. at that time there was no MTV during that time. Early on, it was, it was not MTV. How did you know what the look was that went with the, the music? Well, so, well there was always some reports about America. So you, have, you have to look for it. There was some music report. And I remember seeing uh, the Furious Five, you know, with the hats and the mm-hmm. outfit. And, and I was like, whoa, that looks hard. But, you know, we were attracted by it because they look like us. Mm-hmm. To me, they look like. And then, then Jackson 5 came into the fold, you know, and that was a different form. Mm-hmm. You know, and then Earth, Wind, and Fire, and of course, the Godfather James Brown, and I had a tape I had recorded on television of James Brown explaining how we made music and mm-hmm. how those dances, how we made those dances, and they were connected to certain grooves and how he worked with the band, and and that was really really interesting. But it was difficult to understand, so I always had to get a dictionary. It would take me a long time to figure it all out, but. I would figure huh. it out. Yeah, for for you, uh, were you um, able to witness any of those concerts? Like, how often? What was the the scene like for Americans to come over and tour? Like, how often would you see shows or artists of that caliber? Well, you know, I used to when we were in P. Eins, you know, in 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 Munich, Germany, a lot of band came through. So I saw uh, Charlie Wilson, the Gap Band, for example. Mm. And, and then um, it's funny because we, years later, we ended up meeting each other a few times. So okay. that was someone that I was exposed to the music and it was very, very, very powerful. Uh, Whitney Houston, Prince, Prince came two or three times and uh, we were invited to to go and see the show. You know, at, uh, it was Olympiad Centrum and, and that was amazing because we saw him in the big stadium and then he used to do those small shows and I got a chance to see a few of those. And oh, the after shows. Close. Okay. After shows and you were close in the front and that was just, and that was some crazy stuff to, to be able to watch it from very close like that. Could you tell our audience um, how uh, you first connected and uh, met your partner, uh, Rob, um, how you Rob, guys met? Uh, 
Yeah, the, the first time we met, when, when I got to Munich, I didn't know nobody. And I was there with a couple of friends. But the first time I, I, I it was a few times. But the first time where I noticed that it was very competitive between each other was uh, at a university show, and it was break dancing on stage. I had met him short. I had met him shortly before that, and he he, he came across kind of arrogant, and I knew why because we were on his turf. And it was like who was the black those black guys because there were there were no black guys in Munich at the time. So it was like okay, this dude is coming to my turf, and um, that night. I heard about the party where he was going to be performing and we were invited by this dance school that I was, that I ended up working for eventually. And, um, he did his thing on the floor and rocked it. And then at, at the end of this, this, this thing, this, this choreography on the floor, he stood up and just pointed straight at me. And I was like, Oh damn. That might do straight. Like, what do you want to fight or something? <laughs> I don't know what it was. <laughs> Can, can I ask you, because it's something is lost in the fact that you are a man, a man from Paris and you moved to Munich. Uh-huh. I'm kind of confused as to how you maneuvered, how you learned the language, because as I was watching the doc, I, I, I kind of learned that it took you a minute to learn the language. But how right. did you? Well, what happened was um, I studied German for one year in school, okay. but I love languages, I've always been very good with that. So. I had that, and then when I went to Germany, because some of my friends were dancing and were teaching in uh, in Germany, so they were like, "Hey, you you should come down. You know, you're gonna make some money." I was like, "Oh, really? Cool." Because before you had the Dutch mark, you had the Gilders, you had the French francs, but the <sighs> Dutch mark was always don't remind me was always uh, <laughs> it was always stronger. So when they told me, "Yo, you want to go over there?" I was like, "Yeah, experience something else." So I went over there and I studied. I started teaching, and then I was like, you know what? I want to travel. Paris is Paris was another place where I was really truly happy, and there I was with a group of people that I was having fun with. And uh, when I when I turned eighteen, I was like, I'm out. And then because I was I was of age, you know, I was a, I was no longer a minor, and I could travel by myself. I was I made some mistakes, ended up on the street. You know, no money. I need to call mommy and say, hey, can you send me some money? All proud, but then I had to, you know, call her. And I stayed and and I kept going to the library to learn the language, to teach myself. And eventually, people didn't know that I spoke. So when it was time to negotiate for the dance shows, I could hear the people talking. I mean, they were still so disrespectful, you know. It's like, well, you know, and then I would, uh, you know, I would just oh, say, say it in their language. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would respond <laughs> like, "Hey, son, good." Mm-hmm. So, so that was a, a real learning curve because I was a shy kid, and suddenly I had to like kind of put my chest up and mm-hmm. kind of say my piece, and that was very difficult. But when I met Rob, who was my older brother, then he was taken on the slack. He was like, he spoke the language, he knew the people, and. It became a little easier, but Rob was gangster. He was like, "Poof, my dude didn't care." Wow. When you were younger, um, even before you went to Germany, like, well, one, what what did your parents do? Uh, what was like your home situation like? And like, what is what was it that you wanted to do um, when you got older? When you when you were a kid, like eight, nine, ten, well, eleven. You know, growing up, growing up in Paris, my my parents being Caribbean and Creole. We used to go on vacation every other year back to the roots. And no pun intended. And yeah. um my 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 grandfather was an accordion on his player. And during the summer it was carnival. So he would play those shows. So I would go and see the shows. He would be doing soloing and I was like, wow. And suddenly my parents would turn into children. There was that 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 wall between parents and children would disappear because of music, and I noticed that really quickly. And I was like, "Oh man, I want to get down with that. That's what I want to do." Fab, My what island? Like, what island are they from? Um, Guadeloupe. Guadeloupe. Uh, Guadeloupe. Okay. French, French Caribbean, and my dad is from another island called the Saints. And my grandfather came from uh, off the coast. There's some a, cost, a cluster of island off the coast of Calcutta, India. And migrated to the Caribbean. So I'm, you know, so 
when you Creole, you know, it's like you put everything in the pot. That's yeah. what happened. My brother's got green eyes and he's three shades lighter than I. In- including That's youth, because I, I feel like this is you from 1988 talking. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You still Some good lotion. Like, Some good lotion. Yeah, I was about to say, you still look like you're in your 20s. I'm youth. Thank you. Thank you. I, I need your secret. You. Um, well, so. Yeah. Music. Oh, he's like music, music is your secret, Pat. That's what you okay. Music is a secret, you know, really and, and really loving yourself really? And, and surrounding yourself from good people and loving what you do and trying to sleep as well as you can, working out, eating well. Those basics, you know, the basics, but if you if you practice, you know, and we've 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 time now, we've learned about intermediate fasting. We we know more about, you know, because of the internet, we we've now been able to grab onto the stuff, the knowledge, it's yeah. the age of information. So you can, if you want to learn how to play an NPC, you just go to YouTube, that's all. And you're going to figure it out. That's it. You can figure out anything, software, you you want to paint your house, you want to make a table, you're going to figure it out. We didn't have that. So when it came to playing instruments or, you know, I remember I had an NPC, the manual was so thick. I was like, man, I tried to play with that thing, but it was discouraging because I could only play corners of the machine. Mm-hmm. And, that now what they got, they got everything. Now it's like, if you want to do something, you can do it now. You know, true, I true. To, to try. So the um the first show that you I guess became a professional that dance show. Can you describe what that show was like, or what the name of that show was? Oh man, uh, so that was um, I was doing that with my French counterparts who came from Paris with, and that we okay. got first. And they, they were professional dancers, and I was just new to the group. So they had certain types of choreographies that we would rehearse all the time. And um, one of them was, uh, it, it, it started with uh, slow motion. Like it was like a, like a race, an Olympic race, and the music was from uh, Vangelis. I don't know if you go know Vangelis. It's a, he did the music for Blade Runner. He did the soundtrack for Blade Runner. Oh, Vangelis, yeah. He, he, yeah. Vangelis, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so that was... Chariots of Fire. Of track. Okay. Yeah, Chariots of Fire. That's it. You got it. And yeah. um, we, we started slow motion, and, and then it would go into uh, like a boxing match because we were doing sports, and we would do soccer all in slow motion, and then it would go to, I think, uh, Muscle from Donna Ross. And there it was kind of like... You know, in, in boxer shorts, we ended up in boxer shorts, and then we would go into this in you know, motion and choreography and dance, and then it would be done our summer, mm-hmm. and, and so on. So we, we picked the music that we felt like felt good, mm-hmm. and I would finish with Michael Jackson. <laughs> really? Because I had, uh, I had a, well, I had a Jay Crow at the time, you know, I said, so we put the product <laughs> in the hair. Right, and I would I would go back and change, put my my pants, put the socks on, the shoes, and it would be Billie Jean. You know, of course, you know everybody was was a fan, and uh, I was a big fan too. So I thought, yeah, maybe we should add that at the end to just create like climax, and then uh, just like James Brown at the end of my performance, uh, one of the guys would come and put a cape over my 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 back and I would leave the stage, you know, because I had seen James Brown do that. I was like, oh, that's cool. That's, cool <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. So, so the early days. So can you explain the, um, the process? Like how, how does, uh, how do you guys meet the attention of Frank Farian? Um, I guess for our listeners who might not be aware of yeah, uh, no. Frank Farian, um, Impresario, kind of, uh, uh, what you would say, uh, I guess, a manager or producer who, um, kind of brought forth to world uh, acts like Meatloaf, um, not to mention um, Boney M, as Meatloaf. well. Well, he did. Oh. He did the. Um, he did the second meat. Like, like I know, it took Meatloaf like twelve, thirteen years to make a follow up to. Bad out of hell. So I know that. Uh, uh, who produced the first one, Steve? Todd Rundgren produced that 
bad out of hell meatloaf album right so the 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 follow-up record i know that frank farian produced that um or had a, a hand right. in it is that the um, lone project he did with like a singer who actually sang on his record that's so odd considering like visually meatloaf that's so odd for him after watching his documentary considering like vi- meatloaf visually was not what you would have thought would sell but he really cared about those things that's yeah that's well yeah. that's why i want to know like just in general i don't know much about frank farian as a star maker or as a producer or any of those things so could you tell us like how well, well how you guys we, first met we, him we, but how we met is because uh, we used to play soccer in Munich, Germany in, in summer. And, and the majority of those guys were connected to the music industry. And um, especially one of them was Bimi Oberheide. And he was a guitar player, studio cat, who used to do vocals for Frank and play guitar for Frank. And we were close to each other. And um, we we were trying we were trying with different producers in the city of Munich, you know, trying to get into the music industry. And... He was a friend of ours, and uh, we we told him, "Hey, you know, we'd love to find the right people in the music industry. Maybe you can hook us up." And um, we started to put a band together, performed in a city, and he, this guy also was part of the band. We rehearsed for two weeks and performed in, in Piaints in this club that was a very known place at the time. And from there, people heard they heard about us. And then it went all the way back to Frank, and then via via via, it came to our, it came to us, and so we got the number, and then we mm-hmm. called. I didn't, I didn't know I didn't know who Frank was. I knew Bonnie M, mm-hmm. and and but I grew up on you know Ceron, Ceron. Uh, uh, oh Ceron, yeah yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, great, our our great listener guy. base would know that as the. Rocket in the pocket breakbeat that most hip hop DJs spun in the seventies, but yeah, Saron from France. That's right, and I, that's right, and that was like you know I used to listen to Jean Michel Jarre, and I, I was listening to a bunch of out there stuff, but then Bonnie M came around. I was like, oh, that's cool too. So when when Rob told me, hey, that's Frank Fine, that's Frank Fine, the producer. I was like, okay, I don't know who he is. You know, you know Bonnie M, and I remember going to parties with the kids, and Bonnie M was playing. But I was more into disco, Donna Summer, and right. and that. But then when he told me how big this guy was, I was like, "Wow, let's go, then let's go." And uh, we ended up going to the studio, and that studio. You know, I, I watched a lot of doc as a kid about music, and when we got into the studio, it looked just like. The studios from from America. It was, okay. it was there was Eve consoles. It was it was like the real like with outboard gear like in the square, the whole wall, and it was four rooms like that. It was not one. It was four SSL Eve console, best microphone, everything, and in in every room, there was at least five people working. Mm-hmm. So it was like a factory. So we went in there, and then to top it off, you get all the, the gold records on the wall. So we, young, naive, didn't know anything and never signed any contracts before, don't have a manager or an attorney or nothing, no no experience with in that regards. So going in there was like, man, we made it. Like we, we were the right home. You know, so we, we met Frank and we had a conversation about music with his, his, his assistant slash slash slash. Hmm. And um, because mm-hmm. I say slash 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 because she was she was handling the business. She was the mm-hmm. she was the she was the charmer, you know, mm-hmm. she was like, you know, she she would like, you know, manipulate blind you sparking and speak in a very soft voice. And, mm-hmm. you know, we. You trusted her. Frank would never be in a room too long. He'd speak with you, then you'd be out, and then she'd take over. You know, okay. I just wanted to say hi. So shortly, but we never really had big contact with him. But this is uh, the hi was not redhead. Yeah, uh, redhead young lady that's in the dark. Yeah, right? that's, yeah. that, Ingrid? that's her. Or what's her name? Yeah, Ingrid. 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 Yeah, yeah, Ingrid. Yeah. 
And so, she, she would do the big, she would do the the stuff. She organized so, everything. So how yeah, I wanted to know just the the kind of the basis of operations like so what are they explaining to you at the time that you know you guys have a look we can make you guys the big stars like oh yeah. did, did they even fathom like are they telling you at this moment we could sell trillions of records or are they just basically saying like look let's just make a hit single and see what happens no it was none of that I, as because you know I, I, now inside 2020 the first meeting we had was to look what we look like because they heard about us what they look mm -hmm. like what what are they about you know so we just spoke about music you know and, and it, like i said frank was there very shortly so he was more uh, in contact with ingrid and we, we just talked about our dreams and what we do we wanted to sing you know just like a regular artist who, who gets an opportunity so you try to sell yourself to like yo you know you know we we, we really want to work with you we we sing, we perform, you know, Rob played, played guitar, with some basic blues chords, and we would try to write all the time, you know, so we talked about, you know, the fact that, yeah, Rob played guitar, not very well, but we said, oh, he played guitar, we sing harmonies together, you know, and it was not that long, they were busy, they said, okay, it was a pleasure to meet you, but what was cool is they pay for the rental car, so I was like, oh, nice, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, we didn't have to spend any money to get there. So that, that was cool. So even though the meeting was short, we're like, okay, so we'll call you. We keep in touch. We got their numbers, you know, and like, you know, and this, we were told, hey, talk to Ingrid. She's the one to talk mm -hmm. to. But Frank, no access. But then at any they, time, did anybody, I was, I'm so curious. I'm sorry, Fab. At any time, did anybody comment on your actual singing voices? That's what I was wondering as y'all were going through this part of the process. No, no, no. It was just the first meeting. Then after that, through the months, we, you know, we, we were like, okay, we're going to get in business with this dude. We know he got money. We were doing, you know, we were performing, but it was not bringing the money. So we were like, okay, since we know we're going to work with them, maybe we should call them and ask for, you know, a little bit of money, like, you know, mm -hmm. and they were always very nice and say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's some money. We didn't know that that money wasn't free. So we, we kept calling, we kept calling, we kept getting, because we had to pay our rent, you know, hook up that hair, you know, eat the basics, we didn't have much. So then, finally, we were able to come to the studio, you know, and um, first they played us, they, first of all, before doing all that, we had signed a contract, because we, we came a few times in between, and we signed a recording contract, so that's why, the money that we have been we've been receiving, you know, prior was becoming okay. It's official. Sign the contract. There is no, no manager, no, you know, no attorney. And today I was I, I was talking to someone, and it just popped in my head that we were given the last two pages of the contract. We were never given the contract like, hey, here's the contract. Go check it out like this. No, they gave us the last two pages. I didn't speak uh, German. That, that contract was in German. So mm. we had to, so, hey, here it is. The money was there. It's like, yo, cash is on the table. Like, we won't get, we're going to get some paper. So we just signed. That's the, just like that. So we thought like, man, it's cool. And then after that, we kept asking for some money because it took so long in order to get to the studio until we got to the studio. And then, you know, I, I, I didn't know much about, because the studio that we worked at, they used to have like Tascam. They, ne they, ne they didn't have like the knees with the tapes. Mm -hmm. When we come in, when we got to the studio, we saw all the tapes hanging on the wall. And it was like, oh, oh, what is that? And it was like, it was like, oh yeah, it's because, you know, we, we know where everything is. Oh, cool. But when they play the track, I'm sure they mute the vo the, the the vocals because the oh, vocals. Oh, so y'all are so y'all sang these songs. Oh God, y'all sang no, these no, no, songs. No, 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 oh. no, 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 no. Oh. The songs were already recorded. The singers were already on there because they right. were recording music ahead of time. So if I would have known about 
how a studio works, a big studio works, I could have seen like, oh, lead vocals, backgrounds here, harmonies. I didn't know. So when we came to the studio, they just, they did what they did. I'm sure they muted and said, hey, here's a track. And then it was just instrumental. That's oh, okay. what it was. So, so we they like, didn't play you no. the vocal. Okay, I get it now. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. So, but that track was banging. I mean, you had like, you know, you had the main that was poor. It was like, for us, you know, when you're young, your imagination runs wild. So we mm-hmm. saw ourselves like on stage and doing this thing. Rob was looking at me like we were smiling. Like, he was like, yo, we're good. But we never talked until this point. Nobody came, no, no, no vocal coach. Cause you know, everybody was the vocal coach. I mean, you know, the, mm-hmm. a lot of people were, and I didn't know that, but there's a coach, there's a songwriter, there's, and you take people, even though they don't have the talent at that moment, they got a little something, something. Some people invest and they believe in them. And then after an album or two, like, yo, they're good. They're, they're pretty sweet. But it was none of that. Because the only thing he was interested in from the beginning was to use the visuals. That's all. Because he did it yeah. with Bonnie M. Let me explain. Frank Farian sang the vocal of Bobby, of Bobby Farrell. The what? The guy, the black yes. from Bobby M. Yeah. I did not know that. So, so, so Frank did the vocals for Bobby Farrell. And that's where he found his, um, his formula. Like, oh. That works. Also, the one thing I heard was that, and, and you know, Frank was an artist, was trying to make it, and the mm-hmm. music that he was making, the label were like, hell no, nah. he can make black music, you're white. So I think my dude. And ugly. Oh. Sorry. I didn't think that, but, and, and, and. <laughs> And, and you know what happened? He's like, so as an artist, he was like, oh, so I can't do black music because I'm white? All right, then. So he figured, he figured it out. He got his formula. He got, he got the girls. Mm-hmm. He got the guy. And then he did the vocals from the guy. And then he kept working, kept working, kept working. Then years passed, and Millie Vanilli comes around. Well, he can't do that. So what he's going to do, he's going to go get people that he works with in his studio have them come at night, military operation. We are in Munich. We don't know nothing. They, f- they they got the guys. But the thing is, they were already looking. Mm. They were preparing that stuff in advance. We just came into the fold. We just fell into the trap, not okay. knowing that the sole thing they were willing to, they wanted to use was the face. So singing was ne- never came into play. So when we heard the track, and we were smiling. Then uh, he took us to another room, and then he he, he kind of put it on us, and he started talking to Rob in German because through the years I was more like an afterthought. I was never, I guess, I never <laughs> never was really truly respected. I never felt you didn't have the green so eyes. Happy. Well, yeah. I, I I I was I was missing something, so mm-hmm. it was always they were talking to him, and they would relay everything to me. And he would then he relayed everything to me, and he was getting pissed. Rob was like a firecracker, so I could see him like, "Ooh, my dude is getting mad!" Like, "Yo, we were feeling good a second ago. You messed it all up." I'm thinking, "You said something wrong," and we lost we lost that thing. The dude walked away pissed, pissed because we didn't want to do it. And Rob was like, "No, we're not doing that." So Rob was already saying, "We're not doing that." Mm-hmm. But then, you know. Ingrid, like the, the voice of reason, comes like, I think it's in Mowgli, you know, there's the, there's, I think it's a snake in Mowgli that comes in like, hey. Sweet talks you into it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just, and, and makes you look at reality. Hey, you got some money, you know? Hey, but Fab, in retrospect, when you look at Ingrid and watching this documentary and knowing the history of like where Rob comes from as a, 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 a an orphan adopting child and all of that, don't you think she fed right into all of that? Like she became this also kind of like she said in the documentary, we mother were figure. in, we, yeah, but she said we loved each other with no sex. So not even oh, just a mother. It's a little sicker than that, Amir, because she like mother, oh, but, but he hot though, you know, but we not, it was. Yeah. 
<laughs> Listen, I don't because the thing is, I, I, I when I when I saw that, I was like, it made me feel weird because I know Rob was gangster, and, and let me tell you, Rob was he was always gangster, but when with the drugs, he became he switched. He was mm-hmm. not the same person that I knew, and then it was about it became about him. Mm. You know, I, I because he became, you know, he became, he became an addict. So then he was not the same dude that I grew up with, who had my back and all that. So maybe he was just, you know, taking care of, you know, of himself. There are so you know, many words for this in 2023 with the traumas and knowing like a little bit of Rob's history, and it was inevitable yeah. if it wasn't nurtured correctly that. And you know. he had a big, he had a big void, you know, mm-hmm. and. and Obviously, when you go into entertainment like like I did, and it was, you know, you wanted to be loved, and when you don't get that stuff at home, you're gonna go and get it like, in in another way. And and when people say you, oh, I love you, oh, you're the best, you know, and that when we got that, that's part of the seduction because we yeah. did that for a single, and then obviously we signed, and and a contract for five albums, which we didn't understand that concept because we never seen a contract we just know mm-hmm. we just thought it was two pages but it was a full full-on contract with clauses and right. you know and, and all that first of all can you explain the basis of how you guys came to the name around. millie vanilli yeah okay so the name millie vanilli was uh you know there was a group called scritti politi that was yeah. from london mm-hmm. and we loved that uh, we loved their sounds and we loved it, the way it rolled on the tongue. It's pretty pretty, that's cool. So we're trying to find something. So we, and then we, we were thinking, okay, ice cream, dark dude, light dude, like ice cream. It was kind of cheesy, didn't work. And we like, oh, vanilla's cool. Vanilla's dope. And then uh, somehow, this Ingrid's little name was Millie. And then we, okay. we how we mixed it all up and it was like Miller Vanilli and then it, it had this ring to it. It had Italian, it, it kind of sang and it it stopped. It was like and people always ask, Are you Millie or are you Vanilli? You know, yeah, I, like, I initially thought that <laughs> one was Millie, one was yeah, uh Vanilli. Yeah. That's right, that's right, that's right. And and that's how it, it, it came about, you know, like that. And we just rolled with it. And it, what what happened was we did uh as first trial. I'll tell you, like, how, because I'm sure you're going to ask me the question, like, so how did you, who picked what and why? Because, right. you know, obviously we didn't sing on the record. So it's like, why did you pick that? And why did you pick that? Well, truth and matter is that Rob was like, I ain't trying to do much. Huh. So, <laughs> I love, oh, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. <laughs> So was was the video the first thing that you guys did as the unit? No, no, no. First, it was uh, we did first we did a, I think it was a trial out, and we went to a radio station that was regional, and we did this thing, and there was no talk of of a video, and then that that thing that we did at a, at a TV studio, basic, after picking up the parts, that thing kind of it went like wildfire in the region. And that's mm-hmm. when Frank was like, yo, man, we got something there, you know? And then they, they started to like test the record and play the record in, in the clubs, in, in black clubs in Frankfurt and in a club called Funkadelic, mm-hmm. where Frank used to go in with the vinyl because he had a, a Furman. No, I forgot the name of that that uh, vinyl machine where you can print vinyl. He had, oh, a, right. he had one of them. A test studio. pressing. Yeah. And then he would test press, go to the club, and we come back and be like, so then when when he had it right, then in Funkadelic, you know, he, and Funkadelic was mostly dark skinned people, mm-hmm. mostly. So it was all Americans and, you know, like he was like, yo, I got it. I got it. But, you know, that was done by New Marks, you know. Right. That, yeah. that, that was a cover. So it was not too difficult to like, okay, you already have something that, that is obviously great, and, but he blew it up. You know, he had big, better equipment, but it kind of duplicated exactly what it was. But I can't take take it away from him that first he had the instinct of pick that one or somebody else picked it and brought it to him. Right. Okay. You know, so. So at that. what at what point 
do you realize like, oh shit, this is going to be major? Because even then, like you guys weren't on Aris Direcki yet in the States. Like, Hell no. it started out as an indie label thing and sort of just what rose its way up to the top. At what point do you realize like, oh God, this is going to be something? Well, it was that we were, we were living at a friend's house on, you know, we, we, it was like, a, it was, it was a very small apartment and they had this show called Formula One, Formula Eins. And then it was a Saturday because on Saturday the charts would come up and we were there just watching it. And here we were, it was like, and we used to watch your shows regularly, you know, like, and, so, and we used to dance behind some of the people that used to perform on that show as backup dancers. And then there, we look at the TV, we hear the song, we're like, oh my God, we started breaking stuff in that apartment through excitement. Mm -hmm. it, just, it, was like, it was like hearing your song for the first time on the radio. It was a snippet, but we were in the charts because they were playing uh, the chorus of each song from the bottom, like the entry. So I think we, mm -hmm. they were doing the top 20, and mm -hmm. I think we were, we were number 20 there but then it went it went quick like super quick and then then it started to get organized and we had to be then we were sent on the road and then there was like suddenly we had ingrid around and there was a car there was car service then there was hotel and it was planes are you curious about the actual voices that are you're hearing like do you ever always, wonder always. who it would who it is always Always okay. curious. As a matter of fact, I ended up working for the past seven years, six years. I worked with John Davis, who passed away last oh, wow. year. Oh, okay. That's cool. You know? okay. Yeah, so we were on the road. I've been on the road. I performed the songs with the band, without the band tape. You know, I've been yeah. doing that for years. It's super common now. Like, right now, I'm a shit. I just came from a Duran Duran show, and I swear to God, there were at least eight macbook pros with like at least five terabyte uh hard drives backstage so what was the technology like back then because in my mind i didn't start seeing at least like the blatant technology at least until the early aughts like 98 99 2000 where there's pro tools and that sort of thing so uh -huh. what was the, what was the process like in preparing well, for performances I, I, back then well the process is uh what happened was uh we got the tapes because we did 107 cities shows in eight months so right the process is we, we got the 24 track tapes went to the studio and then the, the engineer music music supervisors were in the room and then they they say okay we need this we need this we need this and then they transferred that to a fair light Oh, okay. He went to through a fair light. But before that, we went into, I think it was uh, for the MTV tour. We did, uh, I think, an Oberheim, like the big Oberheim. And then they. So they, everything goes in the keyboard? Yeah, everything goes in the keyboard. And, and so is it triggered. triggered or is it like to the point where, because the thing is, I don't know if back in 89, 90, if there's in ears where you hear the count off and oh. all those things. No, the count off was like uh, the, it was a drummer. Count off was drumming, dak, 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 and then boom. And they would just have to play to the tape. They played the tape, even the okay. band. The band was playing, you know. But we knew that we knew that after like a you know, couple bars, like okay, that's it. So it was rehearsed as well. So we okay. knew exactly I got what it. To, that that's what I got was it. done. So. This was, a lot of work went went into it, you know. It was uh, because it had to be seamless in order to be believable, you know. And um, I, I just love the process of creating the show. We, we created visuals. We, you know, we the band. We even added sections because we thought, because we listened to everything. Mm -hmm. When you came, when you came into our room before a show. It was from ACDC to Gap Band to Cool and the Gang to the Beatles to Led Zeppelin you know, to Sex Pistols. It was everything because in Europe, the charts was, you know, everything went into the same charts. There was no mm -hmm. separation. 
So we, 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 I remember we added a, a Van Halen solo in, in the middle of, uh, so we would come up with those ideas. Like, for example, I had sampled because I had an Akai, I had a small Akai. 900. Yeah, there was, yeah, the 900, there was a thousand, yeah. and then it went up. And then I, I would, I would watch movies in LA, and I was like, oh, I saw Ben Hur, and Ben Hur had the, 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 you know, the, the boom, 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 boom. Right, yeah. And I said, told the musical director, listen, I want to, I want to start the show with this. And it's like, are you sure? He said, yeah, 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 I'm sure. And I, I was a fan of classical music. So when we did it the first time, man, it was like, it was like the arena. Boom, boom, and the crowd went crazy. They were like, oh, we're keeping that. Because they, <laughs> they didn't, they were like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, we're sure. And we pay the bills here, you know, we're the boss. So right. just, just trust. And then it worked. So we would add little things to, to make the show, make the show better because that's how we could really affect. Because the vocals were like, that was like glue. I was going to say, I remember, so I, I used to religiously record every award show and every just basic music television show. I mean, now, of course, you know, with what we have now, you can just go on YouTube and see stuff. But I'd religiously record these things. And what I remember most about the Grammy performance was like the first four bars, you guys actually, the drums were straight out of Compton. And I remember, I was like, yo, like, you know, I mean, back then when I was 17 years old and I, when, when Gary Shandling's like, ladies and gentlemen, Millie Vanilli, and I'm hearing the opening tracks are straight out of Compton. Like, I remember me and my cousins were like super hyped, like, what's going on here? Like, y'all, y'all came out with this sonic, it was yeah. like a sonic assault in yeah. Every performance I saw you guys do, it was like your life depended on it. Like I've never seen yes. two yes. hyper people in my life like really, really sell this prop. So for me, and you like know, listen, listen, listen to NWA as well all day. Oh and shit! So, yeah, yeah. Oh, they were unavoidable. Yeah, That's true. <laughs> yeah, unavoidable. And, and and but sonically, it had so much power. So we were like, yo. We're trying to make our, our show as strong as possible. So that's why mm -hmm. sampling was cool. You know, so if we could hear something that would help us, you know, stimulate the crowd, something that was familiar, now we take that. You know, it, it was just like, you know, I, I as a matter of fact, back in the day, we were we were gonna go into engineering school, but we had to pay, we had to pay something and that money went somewhere else, but we could have gone to engineering school otherwise. Okay. But the thing is that many people don't know is that around the world, the album was all or nothing. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I guess for America, I, I didn't even know it's so crazy that I had no clue that Diane Warren wrote, uh, blame, blame. <laughs> wrote blame it on the rain. Um, so it's the Kevin Lyles part too. That's the, all is. Yeah, I was going. I, I was curious as to did Kevin not want to participate in the documentary right. or? Oh man, you know politics, man. That's all I. That's all I can think of. You know, there must, there must have been some political thing that played right. into because why not, Kevin? You know, as a matter right. of fact, um, uh, uh, Bill Pettaway says hi. Ah. Uh. Well, well, we got him on tape talking about the song. Y'all should have just called us. We could have just licensed some stuff. Yeah, I, I, he tells I, the whole I, story. I was well. Yeah, let's kind of. I want to jump to the end and work backwards. Okay. What? Why did you feel that now was the time? Um, to tell the story? story. No, he had nothing to do with the time. Is is just the wrong people came by always. It was always the wrong one. Mm -hmm. Their approach was like. It was like sensationalizing the thing and it was almost like fictional. It was like, no. Nah. And you could tell, like, because I, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at gauging people. You know, my mm -hmm. manager, Kamalo, as well. And every time we set up with people, you felt like it wasn't kosher. It wasn't good. It was like, nah, man. They just see it's a great story and they want to be attached to it. 
but I didn't feel the genuine and the passion to it. And Were you pitched a lot? Good. Was it a, a lot of projects? How many pitches? Yeah. Oh, man, through the years. First of all, we went through the movie that fell apart. Then it was all kind of like, then it was Brett Radner who was supposed to do our movie. And then because of mm. what happened to him, that mm. fell right. apart. And, and then I was getting tired of it. I gave up on the idea of doing this, whether it was TV series, whether it was documentary, I gave up on it. I said, I said my manager, I said, Kim, Marlo, I said, you do your thing. I, I, I'm going to go to Europe. I, I need to get out of the U.S. And, and, and really just go and do, you know, like get away. Because if I would have, I don't feel like if I stay, I'm not going to be right. I don't have mm. much time. So, so I, I, I left and, um, she pursued it. She, 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 she met people. And then one day she said, yo, listen, I think we got a live one. And then, um, we met and he was, he, this dude, I could feel he was passionate. Everything because, you know, I don't usually trust what people say. So I heard, I listened, I said, cool. But I, I felt like he, he was cool, but you never know. But then I was told, he told me, go watch something that I did. And it's called Delt. It's about a, a, a blind magician. So I'm looking at this thing, not knowing what it was, because he told me, yeah, it's called Delt. So I figured it out. I'm watching and in the first five minutes, this dude shuffles cards around. And I'm like, okay. And then in one second, they go to his face. And my dude is blind. Like, wow. Mm -hmm. A blind magician. And then they followed his dude for four years. And they had to go through a lot of footage. And the story, they, the, the way they weaved the, the whole story was magnificent. It was very subtle, but you could feel each character so you could feel the pain of each and i was like well if they were able to do that with with this story and i was looking at my story where it's, it's bang bang fireworks bam bam i was like wow that'd be interesting to have to go through the motions and and massage this thing and, and make because an art there is an art to making a good documentary but also to report and what they did they did a lot of investigative journalists journalists mm -hmm. Just, and they found out stuff that I had no idea about. I was like, oh, wow. So that's why the more we worked together, I was like, man, my dude is passionate like crazy. He was like, he wanted to get and he get it. And, and even the way he interviewed the, the record uh, executive. I was just about to say that, Fab. The way that he interviewed those record executives Ooh. and made them and asked them, so why were their names on it when they got to America? But this album before their names weren't on it singing. So make this make sense. Yeah, he worked and he worked yeah. and he could hear. And, you and could tell first, that he cared. He cared and he genuinely yeah. cared. And he, he, he understood what happened to us. Because when you're bigger than life like this, people are desensitized to the fact that man, he ain't no human being. He's a star. Yep. He's got money. What does he care? Like, man, little, I can make those jokes. Man, don't stop crying, baby. You're like a baby. You know, and, and we were like, whoa, assaulted verbally so much. When 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 uh, Rob tried to jump out the window, they made jokes about it. Like, oh, so cause and effect, Rob in the end died of a broken heart. They broke his heart. Like, And then he was doing drugs. So on top of that, when you're not riding ahead like this, you know, you know emotionally, your emotional intelligence, if you ever had some, goes out the door. He's gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and you'll never come back from that, especially if you mess up with your brain cells. You know? Mm. So, and they, they were not nice at all. It was so brutal. And me, lucky me, I was like, yo, I'm going to give it up. I, I don't think it's for me. It was a social thing, but I could tell if I would go any further, I would fell off the edge. Mm -hmm. And to, to come back from there, you know, I, because I've seen it in LA. Walking in LA or even in New York, when I, I lived in New York, like in, uh, oh damn, I lived in New York for about a year, a year or so. And I saw people from the past. And I was like, damn, like, wow, don't let this happen to you. You know, mm -hmm. so 
I, I took my health very seriously and actually my doctors told me, listen, remember those words. He said, success comes and goes. Hmm. But the one thing people remember is your face. If you don't look the same, you know, they, they're going to look like, oh, you know, they say in Spanish, pobrecito, oh, poor dude, he's done. It's cooked, it's finished. But if you focus on, on yourself and you keep on growing, you might have a chance to kind of look like what you look like. And if you work on yourself, you might make something out of yourself. Because he noticed I was not right, I was doing the wrong things. But like, he was kind of like a father figure and he tried to talk some sense into me and say, hey, you know, you might have another shot someday. Don't throw it all out the door. Make sure your health is right. You know, and, and I realized that I knew that when you take care of your health, well, you know, things are better. Your mind is better, more clear. Right. You know, things are different. This I man would, knows would, lion's mane, Amir. I told all of y'all. He knows the mushrooms. He knows Shanga. Look at him. He knows yeah. him. Yeah. I, I was going to ask, um, for you, was there a period where you just absolutely positively wanted nothing to do with the story where, like, you just went years without, you know, doing it or, I mean, now it's really great to see you embrace this story. The reason why I've embraced the story now is because before it was very difficult for me to, to just, uh, because I was so fragile, emotional, mm -hmm. and everything people said about me, it was like I was being bullied and, you know, like all kinds of insult. And I was like, wow. It's tough to take. So I, I, I told myself, okay, I'm not going to go back to Europe. Music is really my love. Music is my friend, my, my father, my mother, my confidant. So I'm just going to go and hang out with music, make her proud because musica in French, music is feminine. It's a woman. I'm going to work with her. I'm going to make her proud. I'm going to keep working myself. And at some point, I'm going to be secure enough to not have none of that touch me anymore. But I got to do my work. So I went to songwriting. I went to playing guitar, got into producing, and I've been making music ever since. I never stopped. I never stopped creating, making, making, making. People have no idea. But when I'm going to come, I'm going to come. That door, when it opens up and I'm releasing music, man, I'm just going to, people are going to be like, oh, and nothing and, and nothing's gonna stop me from doing that. And age is nothing but a number because it's all about the work. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when you age, life gives you music. That's it. If you haven't lived, what do you talk about? Yeah. You talk about pain. You don't know pain when you're twenty, no. twenty one. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'm you know, I'm a model, you know, <laughs> uh, model 66. I'm straight up. Yeah, I, I, I was just 66. thinking as a dad, I was like, as a dad, you must be awesome with dealing with bullies and whatnot, because it's like kids, like yeah. if anybody knows how to good. deal with this. Yeah, but none, none of that is happening. You know, we do That's it good. like that. We're lucky, we're, we're lucky where we are. And as a matter of fact, for me, not that I have my little ones looking up to daddy. Mm -hmm. I got to walk that straight line, you know, but for a long time, I didn't have any children. I always wanted to have a family because I didn't have, my family was broken. So mm -hmm. I, I thought, well, if I have children one day, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to be able to live, like relive that, I what I missed on. And that's why now when I create and I have my, my children around, Man, the intent behind everything I do is love. It's love for my children. It's love for the world. I love people in general. And the first songs that I started translating are Bob Marley's songs. So Bob Marley is my my number one, my to go. Had dictionary, the lyrics, the liner notes, the credits, who played what. Because I come from that. I come mm. from reading the information in the records. Who played what, you know? Did you go That's to the island? I was just, you, you said that about Bob Marley. I was like, have you been to the island? To Jamaica? I never went to Jamaica. Oh, never man. went. You need to touch never that, fam. How do you see yourself explaining to your children 
when they Google you one day? Like, what's the life lesson that, that when they see like your this unbelievable career that you've had and the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of it? Is it just yeah. is it just a story of well, perseverance? You know, I feel like it's so much more. I you know in, well, after watching yeah, that documentary, it, it's it's funny how things happen in life. But during COVID, uh, my fans were like trying to reach out, and I was like, how how am I going to stay in touch with the, with the people? You know. And then uh, suddenly the question keep ask keep coming like, hey, how do you stay fit? How do you stay positive? Mm -hmm. I know you went through hell, but I'm looking at you now. You, you're good. And I was like, hmm, yeah, that's right. Maybe I should share because my partner mm -hmm. is a is a health coach, and she, I'm not doing that on my own. You know, I have mm -hmm. someone that's that you know, of course, my manager before that, you know, helped me go up that mountain. But when I came to Europe. You know, and I met my partner and, you know, she's a health coach and she helped me also deal with like some things that I was dealing with in the health and the eating habit and realizing that, you know, health is really the number one. That's what you got to focus on. So during COVID, people were asking me about explaining what I believe in, like how does health play into my, my recovery? And then because the questions were really good, because I used to do this Q&A, mm -hmm. it's called uh, Fab's Funday Blog, and I did about 70 episodes from an hour to an hour, 40 minutes, just answering questions. Then I said, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna create, I'm going to write down my system, because I have a system, but I never give it a name. So it's called Fab Millie. So because my, my, my family is involved, so it's Fab, F-A-B, Millie, M-I-L-L-Y. Mm -hmm. And then what I did, I created 14 icons. I'm born on the 14th. So I created 14 icons that I drew. And then I went through the list, perseverance, you know, love, health, breathing. And I, and, and I took the time to write everything very specifically. So if you go to family.com, it's like, hey, take this. It might help you out. And that, that's that's, but I did that for my children because I did it with them. And as I was drawing the stuff, I would ask my son, my oldest, because we go from 10, seven and two. Mm -hmm. I said, what's that? And it was like, and he would call out everything. I'm like, damn, because I, I had this thing in, I believe in the here and the now that you can affect the future by being here and now. So living in the present, I right? This, living in the present. So I create this, uh, you know, the icon in Google when you, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then my son was like, yeah, now. I'm, I'm here now. You know, and, and he would always kind of get very close. And love, love is a, is a key. And then he said, yeah, love is the key. And I, 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 I didn't, in my head, I said, love, you know, and the key to unlock love. But he said, love is the key. And I was like, whoa, man. So when children, when we, when we think we raise children, they raise us to turn into whatever we're supposed to become. They make us better. We raise them too. But then I have to return the favor when they make me better. So all this, you know, the, that's why I talk a lot about love. And as a kid, sociology was some a very interesting subject, how society evolves, humanity. Mm -hmm. And I read George Orwell at a, at a young age. And now you see where we are. It's like, damn going there like wow world is changing you know now we got ai for we got, got m m you know but it's not m m it's the ai like what right you know i mean now they know people went on strike the writers finally it's over but they were fighting because you know there was some you know ai was coming was going to come over and they, you know if you allow that to happen it's over so <laughs> I, I would say you know, people have gotten, if you look, if you look at the arts, whether it's music and especially music, because I remember, you know, watching Frank Sinatra, Aretha Franklin, I realized that when they would go to the studio, they sing once or twice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then when I would go to the studio, then I, I realized like, oh, don't worry, we're going to fly it. Like, what? Yeah, we're gonna fly it. You know, so you know, so now when you listen to songs, you do your verse, and the verse could be cut up in so many pieces, 
and then you fly the course, then you fly the course again. So no wonder people get tired of, of those songs because there's nothing. So I try to prime myself in trying to sing one of the harmonies in the second verse a little, a little differently with different timbre so that when you listen, at least I put the intent behind it and maybe they will read it. They'll have antennas. They're going to say, oh, I like it. And, and maybe the, the spirit doesn't shut down the minute you hear the second chorus because you heard the first one. It's the exact same as the second one. You know, you know, so that, that as the world has changed, you know, and you I have a lot of insight, man. This is, this is important. I don't think I've heard an in-depth interview about you because normally people are just so hell-bent on, you know, j just like two or three particular years in your life and, mm -hmm. you know, really right. don't get into that. But it's, it's really enlightening to to hear you say but that. You, but, you, but the thing is, you you, you know, I, I, I followed you and, and, and you know, I've, I've, I've heard what you guys did and what you did for others. You, you, know, you didn't do only you, you did others. And, and it was always mentioned, like, oh, all the boats, all the band, oh, damn. So wow. you guys Thank are you. A, a, a standard, you know? And and for me, like, coming here, I know that I can have this con type of conversation. Some are not interested, not of what I'm talking about right now, because it's, it's, it's not relevant to them. They don't get it. So finally, I'm here sitting with you, and I, I, can, I can explain kind of my, my journey because people don't know me as a producer or as a songwriter, but they're about to, you know. But it's 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 a process, and I'm sitting on a lot of music, lots of music, because I never stopped. And, and when I heard Pharrell, and one of you say, uh, "Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop making, whether or not you sign or not sign, you're in the box." They they I saw that too. Down. Yeah. So that one too, right? And, and, and I heard that, I was like, mm, yeah, he's right. And now today with the podcast, you know, I, I also listen to Rick Rubin very closely. And he's also, you know, of course, the, the track record, you know, and mm -hmm. it's his approach is very interesting how he views music and how you should go into it. And when I listened to all those things, I was like, oh, man, I'm on the right path. You know, I'm on the right path. I'm not thinking when I do, I just make. I just, I just make. That's so why for I you. Not so for you. I'm sorry. Time difference. So for you, uh, you've not uh, soured uh, your relationship with music at, at all. Like this hasn't. None, no. none of none no. of that you went through has soured you in your passion of music. No, you know why? Because I, I uh, it, music was, like I said, my mother, my father, my best friend confident because when every time I put music on, man, I'm good. Whether I put Bob Marley, James Brown, Michael Jackson, you know, Charlie Wilson, mm -hmm. all those guys, you know, it, it, it elevates me. So I have to listen to the signs and be like, yo, that's what I, that makes me, that's going to carry me my whole life. If I do anything else that I don't like, I'm going to be miserable. So I got to just face the music, hang with music. I don't know what's going to happen. But I, I, I read this thing where they say uncertainty is the fertile ground for creativity. And, 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 and that is really relevant because when I listen to the masters, you know, like Quincy saying, like, yeah, accidents are necessary mm -hmm. in a track. You know, True. but also, but also in life, you know, falling is good. And if you recover, it's going to teach you something. It's going to make you grow into something that you would have never become if you didn't fall. So for me, I embrace this whole thing. And I, and I said, I forgive Frank Farian because Frank Farian, if I would have stayed because, the, and that's, that's what I think Rob didn't do. But he couldn't, you know, but mm -hmm. I forgave. I had to forgive, you know, the, I had to forgive this man. I had to forgive myself as well. I had mm -hmm. to do that. Because if I didn't, I'd be going in circle, like hating myself. And it's about your, your self-esteem. If your self-esteem is affected, man, you're done. But 
I was lucky because as a kid, I went to a psychiatrist. My parents were divorcing and, and then he allowed me to express myself. And he told me, mm -hmm. dr dr uh, like, go ahead and, and draw your emotions. So I paint too. And when, when I was trying to recover fully, I would draw. So on the road, I noticed that things were not right. So I would draw. And I have I have all of them. It's like maybe Ooh. 500 pieces of little papers. But mm -hmm. on, in those drawings, I would speak what I felt. And, and then it, 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 I would go back to my room and I would think. I was like, oh, man, I'm going to get out of there. I have no clue. But I know I have to get out. Otherwise, my dream was to become a singer-songwriter. That was it. That's what I wanted to do. But taking that route, like how do I go back the other way and, and have people say, oh, it's okay, bro. Like I didn't know where it would, it would lead me, but I know that my love for music, mm -hmm. the love for myself would take me places and then I would have to just go. And, and you know, but I believe in a higher power, uh, the, the, a power, a divine energy that, that is there and that nothing is an accident. Like everything is meant to happen for a certain reason. For one reason or another, mm -hmm. you're meant to go to go through what you go through. Wow. So you think yeah. this movie will be the, the thing to get the rest of the world caught up to where you are? Because I felt that. I felt like after watching this, I, I wanted mm. to say like I'm I'm sorry and all the things if well, I yeah. laughed or you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a patient man, you know, mm -hmm. and I know that it's, it's gonna go in installment because for me uh, through years, I've been putting all my creativity in separate boxes because I do different things. So I know that, like my mom used to say, chaque chose dans son temps. Each thing has its turn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got to stay healthy. I got to make sure that the, the elasticity of my brain is correct and I'll be able to work forever. If that works, if everything, if everything works, nothing hurts. I'm good. So that means I'll be able to do what I keep doing. I know pop music being on stage is a young man's sport. I know that. But it's one of the reasons why it kept me young because I'm on stage. I perform those songs. I do with a band, I do 75 minutes. With tape shows, I do 40, 45 minutes. And oftentimes there's no dancers. It's just me. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Will we get any of that on that? The, the finished doc, Fab? Will we have any of your original music? Because oh. I know you end it with you singing, you know. The hit, but I, 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 I'm doing something right now because I'm I'm working on something right now that's gonna. Eh, I, I I don't want to talk about it right okay. now, but I'm doing something that's gonna to to close the circle. I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm sure Wes understand what I'm saying by closing the circle, and I'm doing something that's gonna like wow. And uh, I'm I'm doing this, and I'm trying to find the right home, the right label as well. You know, so. I gotta make the right moves. Who needs a label? music? That's what's up. Yeah. That's what's up. Um, yeah, brother, it's man. True. I, There's many ways, many ways to go about it, you know. But I know I got some. Hmm. I got some good stuff. I know it because every time I played for, for peers, they look at. They don't look at me the same. They're like, okay, good, because that's important this time, y'all. Didn't do this the last time. This is that's important. No, no, no. That's important. Okay, that's important. <laughs> okay. I really appreciate you, mm -hmm. uh, one, taking the time out, um, not only to, to share your story, but just to basically, um, I'm glad that all of this wasn't done in vain, mm -hmm. uh, especially for your, yeah. your, your partner, Rob, like, I'm, I'm glad you survived this and really got to tell the story and, you know, really just got the message out there, like, the importance of your health and forgiveness and, and loving yourself and, and raising your family. I just think that's beautiful, man. I, you know, I can't wait for the world to see this documentary and, 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 yeah. and we can, can learn just, from it. Can I just add oh. something? Can I just add yes. something real quick? I just wanted to say this. I don't think that anybody has said anything about this as far as this documentary. I wanted to say John David's name again. You said his name. I know he's passed, but I also wanted to say yeah. Charles Shaw name. And I wanted to say that oh, one, yeah. 
one thing that I that I noticed in this story was a deep colorism situation about the mm-hmm. beauties of blackness. And I just got to oh. say to those brothers, like much respect and love to y'all. Y'all are beautiful men. Like I, I just I, I couldn't get that out of my head. They were such the opposite of what you guys look like. And it was it was hurtful that this this white man decided that that was the beauty that he wanted to put on display because it was closer to his own face. Exactly. But you know what he did, too? He, he, he played us all. And, you know, they have this divide and conquer. So in order to make mm-hmm. sure that things will move accordingly, he, he kept us apart. Kept you apart, right. So we, mm-hmm. Yeah, we didn't know, you know. And as a matter of fact, like when in, in, this, in, in the documentary, when uh, Charles Shaw supposedly went to told someone and Frank called him to the studio and said, yo, you out. Mm-hmm. And this guy, he got his money. That sum has been generating... I don't know how much. I do gets nothing. That's crazy. Oof. So you know my, you know, and I feel for him because you know, I feel him and I see it in his eyes, and I I know I'm going to talk to him at some point, you know, because he's in Europe. But you know, mm-hmm. it, it's been kind of crazy, and with this documentary, it's been also very good for everyone to do it therapeutic because you know, you realize healing, and you oh, you play this all against each other. Oh my. God. And then, of course, Charles Shaw, you know, some people went out to the press and said, man, those guys didn't sing. I understand now. But back then I took it like, yo, you know, you know, but he was just trying. It was a cry for help, you know, right. because nobody would listen to him. That's the thing. Like, I want to ask so much about the documentary, but what I don't want to do is spoiler alert. Yeah. Before. Spoiler alert, yeah. <laughs> That's why. But, yeah, it was, it was important to ask that question. Yeah, um, you know, so. yeah, it's crazy, man. Well, yeah, yeah thank man. Again, merci beaucoup, thank merci beaucoup. Thank you, thank you so I much for. Yeah, man, thank- I'm so glad that I that I was able to to come here, you know, and that you you provided the platform, but also to 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 just ask me the the because you know it's about asking when you ask the right question, when someone asks you the right question, then mm-hmm. it allows you enough space for you to just like, okay, show yourself. Right, you know, and and in time, you know, you you're not allowed to. It's very difficult to 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 get a chance to show yourself, and then your show is a place where people go to because they know that, ah, I'm gonna see him. That's that you know, you go here to 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 hear him, to see him for real, because we know you're gonna go in, you're gonna ask questions, you. you gotta answer those questions, and, and because he cares, Fab. That's a circle back. Yes. And because we care. Yeah, That's we right. definitely care. That's right. Well, thank you, brother. Y'all. I appreciate it. Well, on behalf of Fontigolo and uh, Sugar Steve and Unpaid um, Bill and Laia, and man, thank you, uh, Fabrice, for, for for doing this with us. Um, please see the Millie Vanilli uh, documentary. I believe it's on Paramount Plus, is it not? It'll be on Paramount Plus uh, streaming here in the States. Uh Worldwide, I'm certain that it's streaming somewhere. But thank you very much for doing this. And uh, we'll see you on the next go-around of Questlove Supreme, y'all. Peace. <laughs>